Can you start the recording? Yes. All right, Rob, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning from Milton Keynes in the UK. Um, it's uh, good to connect with everyone. I know it's not quite the same as uh, meeting in, in person. Um, but I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you today about some of the work that we've been doing in uh, the Global OER Graduate Network. Um, the co-authors for this presentation are Martin Weller, Paco Diesto and uh, Rebecca Pitt. Um, but only my name's on here just for the sake of keeping it simple for anyone who doesn't know us. So, um, but as I think will become clear um, as I'm talking, the work that I'm going to be um, discussing is really a collective effort by the uh, GoGN network. So um, without further ado, let's progress. I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of um, what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna say a bit about GoGN and what the nature of the network and what we do. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about why we produced a handbook uh, and a guide to research methods for researchers who are working in the open education field. Uh, I'm going to talk through how we put that together um, in terms of the, the sort of concept behind it um, uh, and the practical steps that we took to actually produce it uh, and also um, the considerations we had around the, the style and the accessibility uh, of the handbook um, and then I'm going to talk about kind of the structure of it and what's in there and, and kind of what you, what you can use it for. Um, I'm not going to go through sort of the insights themselves uh, because there's just quite a lot of them and it's kind of not really enough time to do it justice. Um, so this is really a designed to be a sort of introduction to the handbook, um, a sort of point you in the direction where you can go and kind of explore it yourself. So for those of you who don't know GoGN, uh, GoGN is the Global OER Graduate Network and um, we were uh, founded in uh, 2013 by Fred Mulder and um, in 2017, I think, uh, management of the network came to our team at the Open University. And um, we're funded by the Hewlett Foundation and we provide a network of support uh, for doctoral researchers and postdoctoral researchers working in the open education field. And that includes um, OER, MOOCs, open educational practices, the full range of, of stuff. And so we try to raise the profile of research that people are doing, support them while they're doing it, um, and sort of encourage people to support each other. And uh, in, in sort of building capacity in uh, open education research more generally. Um, one of the things that's kind of uh, particular to us is that we're in also interested in openness as a sort of process or feature of research. Openness as a function of what we do. So we explore openness as an approach as well as um, as the sort of object of study, if you like. Um, we have currently more than 100 um, researchers within the network and more than 200 experts who are connected as an interested friend or as a mentor uh, or as a PhD supervisor. So we have several hundred people in our community of practice and um, we have a particular interest in um, supporting research that's taking place in the global south, um, which historically has not had the same uh, opportunity. So, why did we produce a research methods handbook? So, um, I think the place to start with this is, what is a research method? And the kind of uh, deceptively simple answer is, well, that's just how you do research. It's the approach that you used. It's the way that you did a study. It's the way that you collected and analyzed your data. Often it's presented as a hypothesis that's tested. So evidence for and against a particular hypothesis. But underlying all this is uh, the idea that someone is claiming to produce some sort of new knowledge. And so the research method is what, is what provides the validity for that um, claim, if you like. So because you followed a particular method, um, method is sound, the outcome of that method is valid. So um, I say deceptively simple because a lot hangs on this idea of uh, validity, I think. Um, so one way of thinking about this is the method that you used is just the sort of tip of the iceberg. And a lot of the time, if you do research 
for example, on the undergraduate level, you might just have to say, this is the method that I used. And you don't really have to do much more to justify it than that. Um, but at a doctoral level, you're required to do a bit more in terms of exploring what's under, underneath the surface of that. So at the sort of first juncture, there's the systemization of, methodology, of, of methods as methodology. So comparing different methods. Um, but then you kind of go to the next level and realize that there's also different theories underlying these different approaches. And they don't always agree with each other. So there's a sort of job to be done to rationalize that and find a way through that. And at the most sort of fundamental level, these considerations are philosophical. So um, part of the reason um, I think a lot of uh, doctoral uh, candidates find method challenging is because this could sometimes is their first experience of engaging with these kind of um, philosophical themes at this level. So the main examples you'd often find if you read uh, lit literature about research methods, ontologies, so what, what there is, what's gonna make up the kind of the world of your study, um, epistemology, uh, your, your theory of knowledge, your science of knowledge, how do you know things? What does it mean to know things? Um, and axiology, which is not in every approach, but um, really refers to the values that you're bringing to research and the kind of um, the ethical dimensions of what you're doing. So there's quite a lot of stuff in there to think about. Um, part of the way we ended up doing this work is that uh, Within GoGM, we often give people kind of one-to-one -one support sessions and we have kind of discussions about people's research and stuff like that. And consistently, something that always comes up is research methods and methodologies. And so in a way, this is a response to that. If you're a PhD uh, supervisor or an AD supervisor or a student, you probably also encountered this kind of thing. Um, there's something that gets people outside their comfort zone with research methods. And um, this can actually have quite a big effect on your ability to complete a research project if um, you feel like your confidence is undermined because you don't understand every research method or how it all fits together. And the idea is also, you know, how can it be that I'm a doctoral candidate and I don't understand these research methods? Um, interestingly, a lot of the time people were more comfortable raising this in a one-to-one -one situation rather than in a group. And I think that reflects that. Um, so there's one element to this, which is just we were trying to meet a need um, that people had spoken about. And um, on, alongside that, there's also this interest in openness. How is openness affecting the way people do research? Are people using different methods? Are they using existing methods in new ways? And what's the kind of implication of that? Uh, so we're trying to address people's insecurity and confusion around this stuff contextualize uh, research methods within open education. Um, but we're also interested in um, leveraging the people who are in the network and their sort of embodied knowledge, if you like, their experience of doing research at different, in different um, contexts uh, and sharing that widely. So in a way, this is a kind of open practice. Share what, what worked and what didn't work about a particular method for your research. Um, and we were very keen to make it uh, an accessible resource uh, and a good entry point for people so that uh, new, new people coming into the network who maybe are just starting out on a, on a, a PhD or an EDD have a resource which is built by people who've just been through that process. So the authenticity of it is also considered important. So we went about it in a, in a kind of crowd, crowdsourcing way. Um, back in January, we first announced all this work. Um, we had a, a webinar in February where we kind of got input from members into the scope of what we were doing, what kind of things people might want to see in there. Then we did a survey where we collected data from members. And the original idea was that in April, around OER20, we were going to have a face-to-face -face workshop to, to you know, collectively work on this stuff. Um, 2020 had other ideas, of course. Uh, so a lot that all moved online. We had a sort of shorter scale down um, process. Over the summer, uh, we drafted the handbook and um, in June we opened it up to a sort of open editorial review so people in the network who'd contributed could go to the, the Google Doc and just, you know, um, contribute to the editing process. Uh, published it in July. Um, over the autumn we've been doing conference presentations and I'm pleased to say uh, this week we are getting the Open Education Award for Excellence for research for this, which is a nice uh, outcome. Um, it's a nice place to get to with it. 
so um, when I say we're trying to make it accessible, I think um, uh, this is very much part of how we kind of approach GoGN. Um, and when we uh, started this phase of GoGN, we went through a kind of um, a branding identity kind of refresh, uh, working with uh, Brian Mathers from uh, Visual Thinkery. And a lot of the kind of um, stuff that went into there is stuff that came out of our face-to-face -face meetings and very input from uh, various members. Um, so you can see some of the things there. I won't go into all of them. Um, we ended up with this uh, this concept of a kind of golden age of travel motif, and the idea of you know um, bringing people uh, to our face-to-face se uh, -face sessions as well as online, but also the idea of an intellectual journey being supported. Um, and again, 2020 had some other things in mind for uh, the face-to-face -face side of things. But we kept the idea of a journey and the idea of a, 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 the journey um, through these kind of um, ideas and materials. So we start off the handbook with this image that you saw at the start, the, uh, the penguin on the iceberg, um, only seeing a bit of it, if you like. Um, and then we take that penguin on a journey, if you like. So um, using the, the travel motif again, there's passport stamps for these, these philosophical uh, categories, ontology, epistemology, axiology, um, to sort of present the idea that it's something that you just kind of have to get your, you have to get your book stamped, you have to do this stuff, you have to know this stuff at some level. You don't have to be a specialist in it, but you have to kind of make it part of your journey. Um, and then there's various different kind of uh, graphics to sort of ease the, the complexity and the jargon of some of this stuff. Um, I want to show you this one because it's the most complicated one um, in there. Um, and we tried to make it uh, something very complicated, a bit more easy to understand. So this, this uh, graphic shows you um, a spectrum of uh, different philosophical approaches actually to science, um, from scientific realism at one end of the spectrum to relativism at the other, and tries to sort of map how um, within that spectrum, there are different approaches to um, uh, what truth means, what the objective of research is, uh, and even sort of metaphysical differences, um, which if anyone cares a lot about, you can talk to me separately maybe. Um, but I think it's really important to understand how it all fits together if you're going to be a researcher, you're going to be kind of doing uh, work at that level. Um, at the bottom of this, you can see that each of the um, sort of positions there is associated with different um, sort of paradigmatic uh, research methods. We also did some um, redrawing of existing diagrams. So um, this particular um, presentation of the research design process comes from an open university course that's no longer um, in uh, presentation at the moment. And here is presented like um, a map, like a navigational map that's been, been unfolded um, to help guide you where you need to go. So you can move from an initial question, a research kind of proposal, if you like, through the philosophical elements, but narrowing it down to something practical. So how do I base um, a research design in a particular paradigm? Um, similarly, this one um, is taken from someone else's uh, recent publication. This is for, from a medical um, uh, paper, so a paper to teach medicine students about research paradigms. Um, and here you have positivism, constructivism, post-positivism and critical theory presented as part of a research process. Um, and again, trying to sort of show how the differences emerge, but also um, what's consistent about the research process across them. Um, so I think uh, uh, the artwork um, goes a long way to making this um, stuff a bit more accessible. And we have uh, Brian Mathers to thank for that. Um, Brian and I wrote a paper which was published uh, recently in the International Journal of Management and Applied Research. And if you want to know more about the kind of artistic style and what we were sort of going for with it, then um, the link's just in there. So going through the, the actual handbook itself and what you might find within. So we, we devote some discussion to these philosophical foundations um, and also go, go through the idea of a research paradigm and what it means to have a research paradigm. Um, and then from the idea of paradigms, showing which methods are considered to be kind of um, quite common or consistent with particular paradigms. Um, Five minutes left. Thank you. Um, so positivism, interpretivism, 
trans uh, critical approaches, pragmatism, and talking a bit about interdisciplinarity, which is quite common actually in educational research, using mixed methods and triangulation. We don't try to say there's a definitive, you know, approach to all this, but we do try to sort of map out the terrain um, and be sort of supportive in that way. We also do a bit of an exploration of open research and what it means to be doing research openly. So we go through the idea of an open research cycle. Um, and we also have uh, some discussion of the practicalities of doing research, which again, you often don't encounter uh, as a doctoral uh, student, don't necessarily get told how to plan stuff or manage risk and so on, how to manage yourself. So there's some stuff in there about that as well. Um, on that sort of subject, I think we don't, we have an embryonic idea of what um, open practices in research might look like. And this comes from quite a small amount of, of data really, but it's consistent in the sense that it presents a particular idea about how people are working. For instance, a common interest in social justice, being quite transparent, using uh, open ways of collecting and, and sharing materials and so on. Um, so we're still kind of exploring that, but I think, you know, it's quite an interesting thing to reflect on. So um, what will you find in the other half of the handbook? Well, these are the, uh, the particular methods where we got um, people within the network to write about their own experience of using them. So action research, case studies, thematic analysis, design-based research, discourse analysis, ethnography, evaluation research, experimental and quasi-experimental research, grounded theory, interviews and focus groups, systematic literature reviews, mixed methods research, narrative research, observation, phenomenography, phenomenology, social network analysis, and surveys. Um, I think um, we also add a bit at the end um, where we encourage people to reflect on their own practice and um, it's kind of a little bit meta, thinking a little bit about how does this, uh, how can we add value to what we do through being open? Um, and what's the end goal of what we're doing and how can we kind of support each other in doing that? Um, it's been a very popular resource, uh, actually. We've had something like, um, something like uh, 6,000 downloads and we've only got a few hundred members. So, and we know from Twitter uh, that people have been sharing it quite widely. And I think it really reflects a need, not just in, in our own community, but in wider communities for this sort of support. Um, and so we're thinking about doing future editions. I think it'd be quite nice to have some uh, open textbook impact research, stuff like that in there. Um, and uh, I think we're out of time. I just wanted to say thank you to all the people that contributed. I don't, have, I don't think I can read all your names out, but they're all in the report. Um, and I'm just putting their names up on the screen now. Some of them are here today, I think. Um, so yeah, it's been a very, uh, very good project, good output, and uh, thanks everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. Um, we have time for one question, and the last one I see is uh, from Bea. Will there be a research methods part two? Uh, there is, so, um, so as I say, we're probably gonna do a second edition of this book. Um, in the summer, we can do another survey, get some people, to, more people to contribute, but maybe also ask some people to write stuff specifically for us. Um, but we have another companion volume planned anyway for next year, which would be based more on theories. So particular theoretical frameworks and how they relate to open education, but done in some detail. So a bit sort of less practical in one level, but um, a very good complement to what we've already done. That's the idea. Great, thank you very much. And I see a lot of positive feedback in the chat. Uh, and I shared the link uh, to the Connect uh, website where there's uh, the slides available and more links. Uh, so thank you very much. And